Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for the craft Oween mini series. My name is Leah and I am your moderator. Craftsy National Sewing Circle, National Quilter Circle, and Creative Crochet Corner have all teamed up to provide a week of live demonstrations and a bundle of five free Halloween patterns. You want to make sure to download the free patterns by clicking the link in the description. Once you get to the patterns page, make sure to click the picture of the project that you would like to download. And then once you enter your email, you will immediately receive the free download. Every day this week, a new instructor is going to stream live as we sew, quilt, crochet, and cook through these projects. And you will get provided step-by-step -step demonstration of all of these fun Halloween projects. Now, if you have any questions during the event, please leave your comments in the blue chat box below or in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. I'll be keeping an eye on those as they come in through our time together today. And of course, if you're jumping in right at the beginning of our session today, but you have to leave at any point, feel free to come back to the same link Anytime later, after we're done going live, you will have access to this so you can come back, revisit any tips that really worked out well for you, or watch the entire thing if you didn't get a chance to see it. Uh, so we will be here with that for you for replays later. Now, without further ado, you can see her. It's Colleen, Colleen Talkie. She joins us today. I have to say welcome, Colleen. Very excited for today's project. Uh, I would like you to start out by introducing yourself. Tell us just a little bit about you and then give us a little intro into what we are crafting today. Well, I am so delighted to be here. It's great to be asked. Um, my name is Colleen Talkie, like Leah said. Um, I have a degree in home economics, which then kind of snowballed into becoming a quilting instructor. So with that in mind, um, I have worked in quilt shops in different places. I've worked for Quilt Magazine. Um, whenever it came to projects and new techniques, it was always like, let me at it. Let me try it out. So quilting has become my, mm, I say obsession, I guess. If you ask my husband, he would probably agree. Um, I am the uh, managing editor for National Quilter Circle. So as a new position there, uh, you'll find all kinds of things that I'm cooking up ideas. If you ever have an idea you would like me to approach or try out, let me know through the site. Um, I'm up for just about anything. So um, we are gonna be working on the project called the Boo Pla the Blue, ah, that's a great one. The Boo Placement today. And uh, I originally had found this focus fabric and I bought it up right away because last year when I went to pick up some Halloween fabric in oh, late September, there wasn't anything left. And so I've learned my lesson. You have to purchase early. If you some, find a fabric that really speaks to you, buy up a chunk of it and then figure it out because, you know, we can always stash fabric away, but this one really spoke to me. I love the pumpkins with the, the plaid and the stripes and the dots. And it's kind of a graphically drawn pumpkin, so it's not really a jack-o'-lantern. So it's a pumpkin that kind of can stretch into Thanksgiving possibly too. But then when I asked, got asked to do a project for um, here, I decided let's, let's have a little fun and put a little Halloween twist into it. All right, fantastic. We have some hellos dropping into the chat box already, Colleen. Uh, hello from Wisconsin, from Texas. Uh, welcome, welcome to all of our viewers. And once again, if you missed the very top of the hour, drop any questions and comments you have for Colleen into the chat box. I will ask the questions that are relating directly to whatever step of the project she's in so that she can answer them in real time. And then of course, if you have any more general questions or comments, drop those as well. We usually have time at the end of the project to get to a few of those. Uh, so without further ado, Colleen, I'm going to let you get started with step one. Okay. So the beginning, of course, is that focus fabric. Well, let's see. The very beginning, make sure you get that pattern downloaded so that you can either take notes along or grab something to write with and download after we're done. Um, it's just a, a few quick pages that will give you the fabric requirements and all the supplies. We'll, we'll go through those here. But um, it also has the templates for creating the lettering down the side. Since we're gonna do a little bit different, I had originally thought we would do applique, but then I thought, mm, let's try something different. So we're gonna ink some letters today. So uh, the process of getting those in place, and then we'll even look a little bit at the quilting. You can see around the letters here, they're kind of like a spider web kind of quilting. And that was kind of a new adventure for me. I was like, mm, do I take the step? Yeah, let's, let's try it out and have a little bit of fun. So first off, let's get into our supplies. 
Now, when it comes to Halloween fabric, you can find just about anything out there. If you like kind of a country feel to it, if you like more of a graphic feel, if you like kind of a whimsical feel, um, I, of course, that pumpkin fabric, I had to go back and buy more because I absolutely love this. And um, there are other ones. This one has more of a subtle pumpkin print. These are options for other um, variations to this. And I've had this one in my stash for a while and he almost became a placemat, but I think he's gonna be some coasters instead. These little black cats and jack-o'-lanterns would make a really cute um, possibility too. But if you're going this direction, then maybe you wanna put in something really bright or some more subtle black and whites. The possibilities are really endless once you start um, looking at the fabrics that are out there. I'm not really a big orange person, so I had to actually go shopping, imagine that, and find some more orange colored fabrics that would be possibilities. And now I have more ideas than I probably have time for. So that focus fabric is the one you want to start with. Then I wanted to pick something that I could create these snowball shaped blocks down the side. And to be totally honest with you, this is all I have left after making one. So I'm gonna to have to make some variations of different color pumpkins along the edge. So I found some solid fabrics that I really liked also. So you can coordinate with a darker pumpkin color here, or you could go with a lighter one. This is much closer to the um, kind of scribble print one that I originally had. So this would work really great too. And then I decided to pull in um, a black on black fabric, which creates the little corners around the, the snowball blocks here, something kind of subtle. So I picked a black on black like this that has kind of a stripe effect to it. And we'll talk about working with stripes because sometimes quilters look at stripes and go, oh no, I'm not gonna do stripes, those scare me. So there's a few tips on working with stripes that can be helpful to get over that phobia of stripes. And then I wanted, since I wanted to go with a simple black, solid black binding here, when I set the snowball blocks next to the focus fabric, this just seemed to kind of mush together down the center. So what I decided to do is use that black fabric then for a very narrow sashing strip just to define the two areas. And in the end, that sashing is kind of mimicked by the binding on the one edge. So this creates a nice column going down the side. So you're gonna, I use some solid black for that. And then all you need is something as a backing fabric. And so on mine, I went with a fun black and white polka dot, <laughs> something completely different. It's not Halloween, it's not Thanksgiving, it's not even Christmas. I just decided that I had some leftover from my daughter's t-shirt quilt and she had wanted black and white polka dot. And we had found this and I had leftover pieces. So guess what? I got to use my stash. So the backing was this perfect polka dot, I think, to go with these fabrics works perfectly. And then when I want something very subtle, my kitchen dishes are just a, a simple black or white plate with a little beaded edge, perfect for a classic black and white. You can't really see the, the, the quilting that much through it. So if I were to set silverware over the top, no one would know those were there and I could use both sides of the placement. So selecting the fabrics is the first hurdle to kind of get through. Once you do that, then we are into um, some of the other tools that you need to have kind of in your stash of, of, of working things here. Um, one note, this pattern, if you will know at the very top in large type, will tell you that the yardage that is listed here is for a set of four placements. That's kind of the, the normal number that most people would probably create. But I also then down in the cutting, there is a note there that in the cutting, you're cutting for one at a time because some people just want two. Some people want all four. Some people will make four sets of two and give them away. So that way you have yardage for larger quantities. But when it comes to the cutting, cutting one or two at a time, one at a time will kind of 
give you a gauge of how you're progressing through your project. And that um, quarter inch seam is used in portions of it. Other times we're just following a marked line. So if you're a beginner, this is a fabulous place to start. Something small, something accomplishable, and some easy techniques included. So the other things that you need will be a fabric marking tool. There are different kinds on the market. Um, the fabric marking tool, the one that I need will need will be to mark the back side of this black fabric, which is fairly light color. The black doesn't go all the way through. So a red marking friction pen will work nicely on the back of that. Um, you could also use a sew line ceramic pencil in this one happens to be white because I'm going to use it for a different portion of this project, but you can get leads for those that are pink, green, different colors. So those would, that would work on the back. Um, so a marking pencil that will work for the back side of your black fabric. So take note of how dark the back side of your fabric is. If you happen to be working with a solid black, then the white would work perfectly. So it just depends on the back side of your fabric, which of those tools you're going to need there. Then you will need an acrylic ruler. A four and a half inch works nice for cutting the squares that create the snowballs here. I also, of course, most of us have in our, in our tools an eight and a half by 24. This is nice for when you're cutting the larger pieces and squaring up your backing fabrics. So if, if and when people ask me, what size rulers do you suggest someone get at the beginning as they're just starting out? I always say probably an eight and a half by 24 is the best investment you can have because that way you can cut with the fabric and you can line that up to cut large blocks. So because the focus fabric is cut into a larger shape and your backing is fairly large, that ruler comes in quite handy. Um, a permanent fabric marking pen. Now. Here's the thing. I tried out using a Sharpie on fabric yesterday. And I even heat set it with an iron after I did some test marking and it washed out. These really fine Sharpies, they give a great line, but it washed away. So that means that if you're going to be creating a placemat, you want a fabric marking pen that will be permanent. So a Fabric marking pen made for fabric that will be permanent is the thing to use to create the lettering on these blocks. Now, I put in there that it's a 0.05 tip because they do come in different sizes. That means the, the diameter width of the tip of the marker. The really fine tips tend to kind of sink into the weave of the fabric and make it very difficult to um, what we call here, kind of color in the shape that we're creating. So a wider tip fabric marking pen that is permanent is required to do the lettering on here. And then um, I always have in my, in my uh, sewing room, I always have a best press or a fabric starch or something just to keep everything nice and um, crisp as we're working on it. Because we're working with triangle or triangle edges along our blocks keeping them aligned nicely and, and not having things distort. The best press or a sizing or a spray starch can be very helpful in that. Um, the other thing that I will be using is a light table. And light tables used to be these big boxy things that had lights in them. And now they're this little teeny, thin little, little board that um, I can power off of my brick. and light it up so I don't have to stand at the window during the day and trace my letters with my hand falling asleep and my my neighbors all wondering what is she doing standing at the front door <laughs> so a light table though it's not required is a fabulous addition um, Santa brought this to me at Christmas time and he's my new favorite tool so a fabric or a, a light table can be very helpful uh, basting spray at the end or safety pins in order to layer your um, placement top, batting, and backing together. Uh, I tend to use basting spray because it's quick. Uh, Sulky KK2000 is the brand I use most often, but some people prefer to use safety pins or other kinds of products to hold their layers together. Or even hand basting works fine. And then, of course, you will need a piece of batting 
that you will be putting between layers. And um, a lot of times as quilters, we tend to have scraps left over. So these are, I had pieces left off the edges of quilts. So those work perfectly. Um, this happens to be Quilter's Dream 8020. So once you have all of your materials put together, then it's time to do the cutting. So let's get into the cutting portion of our project. There really isn't a lot of cutting in this project. That's why it's a great beginner project because it gets you into cutting pieces of fabric, but not a thousand pieces that, that you have to keep organized and everything. So a simple cutting of three squares of, of your fabric for your pumpkin or little um, snowball shapes. Let's see if I put them off to this side, it'll look right for you when I'm done. We of course have our focus fabric and that cut into, let's see, these are cut four and a half. Everything is in the um, pattern that you're downloading, but these are four and a half. Um, this large focus fabric is cut 12 and a half by 13 and a half. And at first it seems a little bit large, but remember cottons shrink. So we want to have it to be um, a sufficient size when we're done. So it's just a little oversized. So shrinkage is considered in that. Um, we have a one inch strip, like I said, that will float between our stack of letters or snowball blocks. So that one inch piece there. And then we have these 12 little tiny squares. So when people see these, sometimes they're like, I'm a beginner, that's really small. <laughs> so they are very short seams, so there's not as much air there, don't worry, but make sure that they're accurate. That's why the best press or a spray starch will help get your fabric nice and flat so that you will be able to easily cut all of the one and a half inch black print squares that go into each of the corners of your orange fabric. So that's why putting a little sizing on them and then remember to, to take a deep breath, make sure as you um, go to cut out your pieces, I'm always counting just to make sure because rulers, sometimes on one corner, it's a one inch by one inch, but on the opposite corner, it can be one and a half by one and a half. So be very cautious that you have the right corner of your ruler when you go to cut because more times than not, I have seen quilters go, I cut out 50 pieces. Then I got, you know, I had to take a break. I came back, I started cutting again and I picked up the wrong side of my ruler. And now I have them either too small or too big. It's a good thing when they're too big because you can cut them down. But if they happen to be too small, it's, it, it's a little bit of a frustration to have to cut more pieces. So always be aware of which corner of your ruler, unless you have one that's uh, like four by four, then they it would start the same. But if it's a four and a half by four and a half, just be aware of the orientation of your ruler. So are there any questions yet? Uh, no questions have root. come in, but a few comments for you. So Twyla's excited. It's the perfect double-sided item. So that's a great feature for this mat. Uh, and then Gail has a question about your shirt. So lots oh. of for your shirt. Did you make it? I did not make it, but it was made here in Iowa. Um, my daughter, daughter-in-law, Cheyenne Tauke, and her sister, Billy Hazard, have a business and they do screen print and little kids clothes. And the screen print came from Whippoorwill. So Facebook page, Whippoorwill, you can find this cute little pumpkin with the uh, leopard print. It was just something fun. And I thought, yeah, that's perfect for our pumpkin boo placemat day. <laughs> I know we talked about how fun that shirt was right before we went live. So I'm glad all of the viewers are loving it as well. Uh, questions, if you've got them, you can go ahead and drop them at any time. But at the moment, we don't have any. So you can get started piecing together the next step. Okay. So the, the quick piecing that we're going to be doing is creating three blocks that will carry those letters down the side of our placemat. So what we want to do is I'm going to take one of those here because I just need, I actually have two in the wings waiting. They're already pieced, but I want to walk you through. Whenever you're working with a fabric that is striped or strongly directional in lines, you have to make a decision whether or not you're going to let the stripes be a little bit whimsical and go in different directions, or if you want them to all go in one direction. Now that's a totally a personal choice. 
I have worked with quilters who, when they saw a stripe, they all had to be running the same way through the entire quilt, which takes a lot of work and coordination. Um, I tend to be one who lets the stripes go any direction they want just to be whimsical and have a little fun with it. In this case, I actually offset them in different directions, but because the pieces are so tiny, it's kind of hard to pick that up. But I wanted to, do, to be able to teach you a little lesson. If you wanted to make them um, kind of rotate around the block, this is how you would go about doing it. Now, a lot of stripes can be also seen as striped from the back. So I will, let's see if I've got my handy dandy little felt table. Now you can kind of see that that's kind of a horizontal stripe across there. So and on the back, you can also see real subtly that it's a horizontal stripe. So if there was, this was a really intense stripe, it might pick up a little bit better. But by placing them right sides together with my fabric here, I'm going to place opposite corners in the same orientation. So in this case, opposite corners, the stripes are running horizontally in both of those. Now I'm going to place the next two blocks right sides together again, but I'm gonna place those horizontally. So the stripes on this are going up and down and over here, up and down. Now, if I were to move those and try to mark them, I would never get them oriented again, <laughs> especially live on camera, I know myself. So this is one little trick that as you begin is to take your fabric marking tool your choice. Um, this is a friction marker, which is okay to use on the back side of fabric. I would not suggest using this on the right side. It is heat erasable, but sometimes when heat, er it, heat erases, it leaves kind of a ghost line behind. But because this is on the inside of the project, it's okay. <laughs> so what I'm doing is taking my ruler and I am marking a line diagonally corner to corner across each of the black squares so that I will have a stitching line when I move this to the sewing machine. And I bright, it's bright red. I'm not sure that the camera will pick that up here, but if I take out my little handy dandy felt board, Sometimes I feel like I'm back in kindergarten, <laughs> but the red line, hopefully you can pick up there. See how it makes kind of a snowball effect all the way around. And that's where I'm going to be stitching these pieces together. So if you need to put pins in there, have pins available, but tiny little squares like this tend to be easy to manipulate by hand. So you don't need to have pins to hold them in place, especially if you're working right near your sewing machine so you can easily move them without losing the orientation. Now I have, which sounds perfect for Halloween, but I have a spider fabric in my machine so that it will cleanly move from one piece of fabric to my patchwork. And a spider just means <laughs> it, it's not not literally a spider, because I don't like spiders. Um, I grew up in the country and we always have spiders, but a spider in quilt world just means a tab of fabric, probably from your wastebasket, that you can easily run off and onto, because once the machine gets off the fabric, it's stitching into nothing. And it says, oh, I'm going to tangle up the thread. So if I start with a, a spider to the back, uh, under my presser foot, and stitch off of that onto my patchwork, it easily transitions from one to the other. And then I snipped it away with a little, with a scissors. And then I can, once I've got my patchwork done, I can go back onto the spider. I stitch just far enough so that I can get in with the tip of my scissors, snip it loose and rotate my block. And some people will say, well, that's kind of silly to do, but have you looked at the price of thread lately? <laughs> A spool of thread is not cheap. <laughs> and if you are using long tails on your patchwork, you're throwing a lot in the wastebasket over time. So this keeps me from having messy patchwork, number one. I don't have any thread tails. And I can easily stitch from off and on to that little piece 
multiple times so that I get nice clean patchwork when I'm finished. Not that I get overly um, concerned about thread tails, but sometimes they just kind of annoy me because I end up wearing them. <laughs> they're stuck to a sleeve, they're on my back, they, they land on my socks, they end up in the laundry. And then my husband says, hmm, have you been sewing lately? So this also will keep you neat and tidy also. Okay, on to the fourth side, there we go. Snip that away so it's ready for, and put the spider back in place. He does get a little hairy legged after a while because there's little pieces off the edge. So he does look a little bit like a spider over time. Now, Colleen, can I interrupt you for just a moment? Yes, we got a about those corners. Mm -hmm. So Paulette is curious if uh, gluing them down at the top corner is an option for this step. You could very easily on the outer corner just put a glue dot there with your fabric glue and touch that piece down it will stay in place perfectly while you take it to your machine that is a good solution perfect and one more question this one's a little more general but we're not too far from the cutting stage uh, okay. melissa is asking if you wash your fabric before you cut it in order to pre-shrink it now, melissa says uh beginner beginner here <laughs> <laughs> oh beginner beginner um I tend not to pre-wash, but I have gotten burned a few times. Um, if you are using something that is, the fabric is very stiff and it seems like there is a lot of ink to the fabric, you may want to pre-wash in advance. Um, and if you're using a lot of um, strong contrast, maybe a bright purple and a pale yellow, something that you're afraid that color will bleed or leach from, um, go ahead and pre-wash. If you were to interview all the quilters on the planet right now, it would probably come down 50-50, right in the middle. It, I've worked in enough quilt shops, I've talked to enough quilters, and the, really every time we ever did like a survey at the door, it was always 50-50. So it's, it's kind of a personal choice. If you're afraid of something um, shrinking excessively, it's always a good thing to do that in advance. This morning I was talking with quilters about flannels, and flannels, yes, I would always pre-wash flannels because the shrinkage and the fibers are less tightly twisted and they tend to shrink at a higher rate. So flannels always, yes. Quilters, cottons, eh. it, it's more important to pre-wash always when you're garment sewing because you're trying to fit a body in a perfect shape. Quilts, you know, a little here, a little there. <laughs> it's, it's a toss up. So you decide. It probably at the at the beginning, if you're comfortable, not comfortable, not pre-washing, go ahead and do it because no one's going to know the difference. If it makes you feel better and it gives you peace of mind, do that process. That's my answer. Okay. Anything else before we get into putting our pieces together here? Uh, no, that runs us through what we have so far. So we're ready to move on. Okay. Now we are going to take these to the iron and we're going to press to get our pieces exposed here. So it looks kind of more like a snowball block, what we call this. But in a little bit of forethought ahead, we are going to stack these pieces together and we're gonna have seams that intersect here that we're gonna to try to join together. So in your instructions, it will tell you to do a little bit of positioning on the, in the pressing area. So what we're gonna do with the first one, it tells you, well, let's see, how did I tell everybody to do it? <laughs> okay, we're gonna press these out and I'm gonna press these in. Now that's totally different than most of the time when you work on a snowball block, usually you're taking the little corners that you've replaced and you press all those out in this direction. But by pressing two of them up and two of them back, so the back looks like this, you will have nesting seams by doing that three times. You'll have nesting seams as you join these together and then you'll have perfect intersections. So anytime you can get a perfect intersection, go for it, right? So that's how we go about doing it here. So hot iron, see if we can make sure that the iron gets caught here. Always press first, heat the fibers up because warm fi fibers tend to bend nicely. So we put the iron on top and get everything hot first. And then 
The top two, I'm going to press outward. And the bottom two, I'm going to tuck and press the black square under. And I'll show you the back side again as soon as I get this pressed. Sometimes there's a little finger pressing in advance kind of gets everything where it needs to be. So then when you bring your iron in, it's easily slid under there and creates the shape you want. So that's the front. So you see the little triangles in each corner, but on the back, you can see that these two are pressed back to the, toward the back. And then we're gonna repeat that on each of the pieces. We're gonna get it hot first. Remember when you're pressing with cotton fabrics, it's best to do this for, I think I'll do all these with finger pressing first. Make sure you have a hot iron. That's really important. If your iron is just on a real lukewarm kind of setting, it's not gonna get the nice crisp crease that you're looking for. So a hot iron. And then remember, if you have it set on a really hot iron and you unplugged it and put it away, when you go to press that blouse of yours, remember to change the setting <laughs> because that hot iron may not be happy with your blouse fabric, but it likes cotton. So again, the top two out, the bottom two toward the back. And we're gonna do that with the last ones. Just get it hot first. Working with irons was kind of something that I really had an aversion to when I first came to quilting. I didn't like to press anything. I, I was like, just, just keep sewing. And then I realized by taking the time to actually press each step, I had better success with seams joining together, things matching up, and it gets you out of that chair. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll just sit there all day and just keep sewing. So get up, move to the iron, press, and get things nice and crisp. Okay, now once you have those pressed, you can use a larger scissors, but since these are very small pieces, I can use just a, a short blade here. And we're going to clip away the excess fabric so that we leave approximately a quarter inch of seam allowance. Now, the seams have already been done. So if it's not an exact quarter, it's not the end of the world, but close to that on all four pieces. Sometimes people will take these to the rotary cutter and the ruler and they're very exact about it. But like I said, the, the seaming part has already been done. So whether these are a quarter inch exact or not left behind really isn't vital so that we don't have all those thick layers in our seams as we join the pieces together. Now, some projects, when you're trimming off these triangles, they're fairly large, and there are people who will collect their little bits and pieces and make more blocks, but in this case, voila, to the garbage they go. <laughs> they're too small to do much of anything with. So now, reposition this. I'm gonna stack these so that the Pressed seam allowances out or at the top, the ones that tuck under or at the bottom. And I'm going to lay all three blocks in the same orientation so that now when I go to stack these together, I will get that perfect um, kind of joining of seams. Now, here's where I get that opposed seam so they'll lock right up next to each other. And I'm just going to join one of these together real quick. Let's see if we can keep perfect matches if I don't even pick up a pin. Set your seam allowance for a quarter inch because in the first step, while we're sewing just on those marked lines, I had my needle in the middle position of the foot. So I wasn't worrying about seam allowance or anything there. When I go to seam these together, remember to move the needle to a quarter inch so that I have my needle so that the outside edge of my foot to my needle is a quarter inch. Let's see how well we did here. I need to join all those together. Hopefully, if the quilting 
fairies are with me. Not bad. So that's how it joins together. The perfect match there. And then you would continue by adding the third one. But we do need to address how to get the lettering down on our blocks there. So when I was working with the kind of scribble print in this original, the variation of the oranges in the fabric did make it a little bit more difficult to color in the area and make it very dark. So in this example, I'm going to use, I, I've selected a solid fabric so it'll be easier to color in the letters. There are lots of ways to add lettering to a project. You could cut vinyl that goes onto fabric and apply vinyl letters. You could create applique letters. You could leave them empty and not put any letters on there and they would last through Thanksgiving. So <laughs> you decide how you would like to go about doing that. Now the templates are in, included in the pattern on page four and using our light table, let's bring that out so we can go about getting our design onto our fabric. Oops, turn my brick on so we have some power. There we go. Now, if you've never done any inking before and this makes you nervous, it's time for practice. <laughs> so I have just cut a four and a half inch square. I've marked off my stitching lines and approximately where my little um, corner pieces are going to be. And this is going to be my pra practice piece. Sometimes we all deserve to have a kindergarten effort, <laughs> that beginning one, because we've put our patchwork together and we don't want to mess up and want to again get the technique perfected before we jump in and do inking for the very first time. So I'm going to take my fabric and I'm going to just get an approximation for the center of the block. I don't want to mark it at this point. I just want to have a full line there so I kind of have a visual of where it's at. And then I am going to take, because this is the beginning, kindergarten beginnings of it, I'm going to lay it over the top. Now, if you're afraid of it shifting at all, if it shifts a little, it won't be the end of the world, but you could tape this in place if if that makes you nervous of having it over just laying on top. Now I'm using a water soluble fabric marking pen here so that I can just do a simple outline of where my letters are. Because on my very first attempt to do this, I was really worried about whether or not it would bleed, what it would look like, would I be able to fill in the design nicely? So you can, um, that's not gonna be visible enough for you guys to pick up. Let me pick up a brighter color here. Let's do something like this. Since I'm gonna be coloring over it, I'll use the friction marking pen because I'm gonna color it in and it will all be black in the end. So just going to trace the outline so that I have the outline of the letter I want. And you can make it thicker if you want. You could. Um, if you don't like either one of the type styles I chose, you can easily go to your computer. I believe these were about a 250 point letter size. So you can increase any letter size you like, a type style. Maybe you prefer your own handwriting because that's kind of a nice thing to use too. So I have outlined it onto my fabric and then go back and do the coloring in so that you kind of have an idea of where you're, where, where you're headed on this. And the, the light table does help. Um, as I get older, my eyes need more and more light all the time to see. So it's literally just simply coloring the letters in nice and solid. And you may need to go back a couple of times and fill in areas if it didn't get quite dark enough. But if it's just shaded black, that's okay too. It looks kind of like a tone on tone fabric that way. But like I said, there are other ways to add that design if you would like to use. A lot of people have um, 
vinyl cutters. And if you use vinyl for designs like this on wearables, cutting out vinyl letters would be a fabulous way to add letters to your placement also. So it's, like I said, it's just basically coloring in the shape, getting it dark enough and heavy enough so that you like the way it ends up. And you don't need to color all of the very first one, but at least it gets your your training wheels on. <laughs> and then you can knock the training wheels off and you can then place your letters onto your fabric so that you can see easily through the fabric. If I tilt this up, you can see that the shape easily appears right through the fabric so that you can um, trace it first. I, I'm kind of an advocate for trace it first and then fill it in. I have done enough quilt labels knowing I know exactly what I want to say and I start writing and I misspell something no matter what, even though I'm tracing here, it's sometimes nice to have it all kind of outlined ahead and then go back and color it in. It's much more relaxing. <laughs> okay, so once you get all of the letters put onto your fabrics and it's ready to go, you've got all three attached, the, the next thing you might want to practice on this piece is the spider web effect. Because this is something that kind of free form, I did not, I just put a few lines in, but um, to keep you from tearing out your stitching, because I know as quilters, we think, okay, I'm gonna do this and we quilt it. And then, and then all of a sudden we have this in our hands and we're taking it back out. <laughs> Notoriously, sometimes we put twice as much thread in than what stays in the quilt. So um, <laughs> one thing you can do is kind of give yourself a practice on your little drawing here is that I, you can use a fabric marking pen of any sort that will show up on your fabric when you go to do the quilting because those quilting lines go through all the layers in my placemat. But in order to kind of get your hand in the motion for what you're going to be doing, I had to think about how do I incorporate a spider web effect in one continuous line because I didn't want to break thread over and over again. So I decided what I would do is with my, my machine, but this is, you have to think about this as being the needle in your sewing machine is that I wanted to make an arch and then I wanted to come into the center and back out. And then I wanted to make an arch then into the center and back out. Now, in that process of going in and back out, if your lines don't perfectly match one over the top of the other, I'll give you a hint, mine don't either. So it still gives you the effect of the spider web in and back out, and then arch to the next edge. The arches don't all have to be the same exact curve. In fact, I'd, I highly doubt that any spider creates, well, he might, I suppose. I've never studied a spider web long enough to see if every piece is exactly perfect. So in and back out, and then that last arch, and then in and back out, and you will be able to quilt the entire shape in one sitting as you go around the um, spider or the snowball block. So let's look at this guy. We'll get the light table out of the way. Oh, I guess one last thing. We do have to have the final construction. So we have two of them. The third here, um, whoops, our focus fabric and that tiny little strip. So that tiny little strip goes along one side and then your focus fabric here so that you create your entire placement and then layer it up and start the quilting process. So do we have any questions at this point, Leah? Uh, a couple comments and a question. So let's get through a few of them here. Uh, <laughs> there are big fans of the pressing that you were showing. So Twyla really likes that pressing hack for the snowballed edges. Mm -hmm. um, and Lynn wanted to shout out that it's a great tip to heat the fabric first before you're pressing your seam. So thank you for highlighting that. Yep. Uh, yeah. Another question yeah. is about your iron, and it comes in from Wendy. Wendy wants to know what kind of iron you're using for all of that pressing. This one happens to be a Maytag cordless iron, 
because when you're doing video, cords are just not your uh, friend sometimes because they tend to get all tangled up. So this happens to be a cordless iron. Um, there are quite a few different cordless irons on the market. They are great when you're pressing like backing fabric or if you're making your backing for your quilt and you have to press that big seam, you know, you're trying to deal with maybe a 90 by 90 piece of backing fabric and you've got a cord and an iron and you're just everywhere with it. So cordless is very nice for that part. Do note that cordless irons only heat when they're on their base. So if I'm, if I'm pressing something and I sit it on my ironing board and forget to put it back on the base, it's not gonna be at its optimum temperature when I go to use it because it tends to cool quite quickly. So every iron has a plus and a minus. <laughs> That's just something to be aware of if you're going to go in the cordless direction. So um, this one also has a retractable cord. So the cord winds inside the base and a, a, a lid that snaps over the top. So it's easily can be taken to class, it can be stored on a shelf. So it's it's nice that way. So. All right, that's okay. it that we have for now. So we can continue okay. on. Okay. Now, once you get um, your pieces all connected, and we talked about how to do the quilting in the snowball portion here to create those spider webs here, then it was to decide what do I do with the rest of my placemat? Because it's very busy. There are light areas, there are dark areas. Will I be able to see the quilting? Do I want to take that much time invested to, to quilt the rest of it when this is kind of the focused part of the project? So I decided I would put my energy into this area. I did a stitch in the ditch on both sides of the dark sashing here with black thread. And that was a bold choice to use black thread on peach. So that's why I said, if it doesn't come out as you, you make your scoops between the, the points here and go in and back out, if it's not perfectly aligned, it's okay. It, it still gives the effect. So the black thread there, but I went and used black thread on the rest of it. And I just did a crosshatch kind of pattern by using my ruler. And then let's see, back to my wonder of tools here. We have more marking tools than we ever imagined when we get into quilting. Um, I have two different white marking pens that I like to use. Um, and because the dark background here in, in this fabric, it won't show up on the very, very lightest portions, but I could see the line well enough to get from one area to the next as I moved across. And so I, what was the spacing? I, so, I double check myself here. The spacing is two inches. So I did a two inch cross hatch on the body portion of the placemat. And by using a, either the um, sew line or a ceramic pencil, that's, there's two or three different companies that make them now. Um, I'll make a line across it just randomly here so you can see what kind of a line that leaves. So that's that one. And... The next one leaves a little bit wider line. There are other marking tools out there that may work well for you too. Just depends on what's available in your area. But those extra white chalk lines you see there across the, um, the body of the placement are just temporary lines so that I could tell where to do my crosshatch. And then they're easily rubbed off or spritzed away with a little bit of water. Um, I love to do cross hatch. The fun part on small projects is to start in one area, jump down into the stitch in the ditch here, work my way across and see if I can figure out how to go all the way through without breaking thread. Sometimes it doesn't work, but <laughs> it's just one of those silly little games we play with ourselves as quilters. Same way with doing the spider web is like, I think it comes from doing spirograph as a kid. You know, we wanted to make that design and we can get all the way to the end in one continuous mark. And so as quilters, we kind of work the same way. It's like we challenge ourselves. Can I do this? So um, fun and fast to make. So you only have the three little snowball blocks and you've learned how to use stripes and um, have a little fun with those. You've learned some fun um, machine quilting ideas. Um, I'm trying to think. Variations. That's what we were going to talk about. 
the variations on this pattern would be endless. I could easily, you could easily leave off the letterings and make this more Thanksgiving into um, fall kind of thing. So it doesn't have any reference to Halloween. Um, these could easily be turned into three Christmas ornaments kind of things. You could even fussy cut, which means to center a design within the four and a half inch block. You could have Santa faces down the edges here. You could, um, a year ago, I did a fun little joy pillow for a Christmas series. You could change the letters to J-O-Y and put a Christmas print in here and have the, a fabulous Christmas placemat for your celebrations. All right, Colleen, we have some questions that have come in here as well. Uh, first, I'm going to ask you, Gail. Uh, Gail wants to know what kind of pens you use for the permanent lettering that you've been showing. The permanent. Okay. Um, this happens to be a Fonz and Porter fabric marking pen. There are lots of them on the market as long as they're an acid-free marking pen. Um, most of the time, if you go to a, uh, your local quilt shop and ask for a Pigma pen, something to write, say, um, making cr uh, quilt labels, those kinds of pens. So there are lots of different companies that make really good ones. Just make sure that you get that larger tip so that in the coloring process, it doesn't take forever to color in the letters. <laughs> All right, and sticking with that boo, the printing that you have, Diane wants to know, do you put the boo on the pumpkins with pinning? With pinning? Oh, when I was laying the fabric over the design, um, I just taped that. I, and when I was actually doing mine, I didn't want to shift, so I just did a couple pieces of tape. Or you could even use a tiny bit of glue stick in the outer corners to keep it centered over the letter as you're tracing it. So if you don't want it to shift out of place. Pins would work if you don't have glue stick. We use a lot of things. It's just trying to keep it flat against the light table is kind of a thing. So, you know, pins are gonna make it kind of ride up as keep them to the outer edge. You might still be able to use pins there. All right, and now let's move to what you use to mark the front. So Denise wants to know what brand was the white pencil that you used? Always on the lookout for the best tool to mark the front of projects. Very good. Um, this one is a new one that I picked up. It's made by Soline, and it works like a mechanical pencil. So the lead is fairly wide. It's a white ceramic kind of chalk. And I just picked this up recently at a quilt shop. I, I too, I'm always looking for the next greatest marking tool. So that's why I have an entire assortment in my drawer. Let's see, what color fabric am I marking on? The biggest thing, the hardest thing to find is something that will mark on chocolate brown, black, navy blue, hunter green. Those are really hard to find and find something that will make a fairly fine line so that it's accurate and that it's easily either you know spritzed with water or a damp cloth to take off. So um, these ceramic pencils work really well. So look for them at your local quote shop or online. Let's keep things rolling. People are really interested in your tools that you use today. So Tracy wants to know if you can share the brand of the light table that you've been featuring. Oh, that one. Hmm. I don't know if it has the brand. It just has labeled LED drawing tracing pad. So draw LED, so it cuts the kind of lighting, drawing tracing pad. And I found it online and then I um, <clears throat> sent the little to my husband. <laughs> Santa <laughs> should bring this. <laughs> and it's just so nice because it's so lightweight. I mean, years ago, I would take a plastic bin, turn it upside down over and under the cabinet bar light on my kitchen counter. So it was this big kind of cumbersome thing. And now I have this that's smaller than my laptop. I'm like, this is so cool. <laughs> so look for an LED drawing tracing pad, and I bet you'll find it. Yes, that's a really great search term to start with. Uh, also, Very if, you're, if you're watching and you have a light table uh, or anything like a tracing pad, drop that into the comments too. We can yeah. crowdsource this one. Uh, yes. I think 
some people are going to be um, adding this to their Christmas lists uh, as well. <laughs> Most definitely. And it was very inexpensive. It wasn't very, I mean, I was surprised. I was thinking it was going to be a lot more because the old light tables of years ago were really expensive. This is so inexpensive, so easily powered, easily fits into any. In fact, I had to go looking for it because it's so small. It can almost get lost in your sewing room or your quilt room. So make sure you put it someplace where you can find it. Oh, that sounds fantastic. All right, we only have a few short minutes left. So Colleen, I'm gonna give you a moment to share any final thoughts on today's project. While if there's a question or two that slides in at the last minute, I can see if we can get to them. So why don't you go ahead and sign us off on today's project and I'll keep an eye on that chat box. Okay, thanks Leah. And thanks for everybody for watching today. Creating crafts and quilted items in the fall when the season starts to turn is the perfect time to jump in, have fun, let your creativity run and create something that's useful, delightful and cheers up your table. So download the pattern for Boo, find that perfect focus fabric, find a couple of accent fabrics and a marking pen and create your version of the Boo placemat. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> All right, perfect. Colleen, I'm going to throw one final question at you before okay. I do my sign off. It just dropped in. Uh, Lynn says, on the same topic of most of the questions, what is the brick that you've been plugging your light pad into? Oh, yeah, that would have to be a question for my tech kid. Um, my son gave this to me uh, years ago for Christmas. Rav Power, a smart brick. <laughs> I opened it and I didn't know what it was. And then he says, mom, it's a brick. And I'm like, yeah, it's heavy as a brick. What is it? <laughs> He's like, mom, you will never be out of power. And it's fabulous because it can, it can power my laptop, my phone, my light table, everything. So nice little travel brick. You can, you can get smaller ones. And I know anymore, this was probably four years old already. So they probably come half the size now. <laughs> I mean, that you can find them quite a few places. Mm -hmm. Just search that uh, charging brick, things like that, and you'll mm -hmm. find them. Exactly. We'll <laughs> All right. Well, with that said, we have reached the end of our time together today. Wow. So I have to say farewell, but not before a little bit of housekeeping. So first of all, we would love for all of you that are doing these projects to share your work with us. So if you make any of the projects from this mini series, make sure that you share these on social media using the hashtag ShareCraftsy. That way we can see all of the work being done in the entire community. It's really exciting to see how you put your own spin on these projects, and we love to see it. So again, that hashtag is share craftsy. And we have to say thank you for joining us today. And if you haven't already gotten your downloads for the free Halloween patterns yet, you can click the link in the description to download all of the patterns for the full week of projects now. And while you're there, make sure to check your email for upcoming live demos in the craft a Ween mini series. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Colleen, for working us through this project. And to all of you viewing, happy crafting, and hopefully we'll see you very soon. Take care.